everyone. Welcome to the CCEM uh, series, our webinar series. Uh, today, Hui Yan, one of our um, FIB operators, will be providing a webinar on the introduction to plasma FIB, or focused ion beam. This is our last webinar of the year. Uh, it's been a great year for webinars, and we will be continuing them back up in January. We have um, webinars scheduled up until May so far, um, which I encourage you to sign up for. So just a reminder, we are recording this webinar. So if at any point in the future you'd like to rewatch it, it will be on our YouTube channel and I'll supply the link in our chat. And as a reminder, if you have any questions throughout the entire presentation, um, put them in the chat and I will be moderating those questions at the end of the presentation uh, for Hui. So um, thank you again for joining us today and I hope you enjoy. Um, Hui, whenever you are ready, you can begin. Your mute is on. I don't know if you've started yet. Do oh, some Louis. advanced uh, material calculation, but today we are Louis, going to be. Can you restart your mute? On, uh, plasma. My presentation uh, includes six parts. So I will start with uh, presenting some uh, basics of the the feed concerning the traditional gallium and the, this one, the xenon we are using here, and I'm going to show you some uh, trips like uh, we use this uh, plasma filament to prepare a sample and uh, what kind of um, APIs we can use to do some automation. And some also some tricks we need to pay attention when we put the protective layer uh, on your sample. And uh, I will end my presentation with some, some uh, by show you some application on the tomography and uh, and with some conclusion and perspectives. So the plasma uh, feed we have insert uh, in CCM is a Helios G4 P feed uh, since May 2018. So like all other Helios, it's equipped with a elastic flex stem. So with the immersion magnetic objective lens and the UC class monochromator, that means uh, uh, very high resolution SEM, and also it's, it's equipped with um, uh, beam deceleration, and also some different kind of uh, detectors from the top to the bottom. We have the ICD, TLD, ETD, ICE, and the CPS, which is below the uh, the pockets. So. Uh, the ion six uh, uh, on it is an uh, inductive carport uh, xenon, so which uh, allows to go to some currents as high as 2.5 microampere at the 30 kV, comparing to the gallium one, which uh, typically is limited to 100 nanoampere. So that means we have access like uh, 25 times faster uh, for the meaning. So concerning the GIS part, so we have the tungsten, the platinum, and the carbon for the deposition, and uh, a xenon diaphragm and a DX for the uh, H. It's also equipped with an uh, easy lift and an in-chamber plasma cleaner. Uh, concerning the analytical part, we are going to install the Oxford uh, Symmetry S2 EDSD detector and the Ultimax 100 EDX uh, detectors in January 2021. So when we look at the colon of the um, traditional gallium and the xenon, we didn't see much the difference uh, of the component. But so why do we have the access to the, the xenon? So the main reason is a different ion source of the two different uh, phase. So if we look at the 
uh, sucks being used in the gallium, which is called a liquid metal ion sucks. So basically, um, metal, which is typically the gallium, is a fitted and uh, uh, which goes through a supporter, which is typically the tungsten. And if you apply an actual field at the bottom with an actual chart, you uh, generate your eye. So on the right is a, a schema of um, a typical uh, limbs. So you have your gallium reservoir, and so here is the tip uh, of the tungsten tip we're talking about, so where we can generate your eye. Uh, so uh, here on the left is an uh, in-situ TEM to show the, the gallium limbs, which uh, is working at uh, different regimes by applying the different extraction voltage at the tip. Uh, from the A, which is the onset, this one we call the, the uh, intermediate which one here we call the most steady, and the, this one here we call the upper steady. So, so practical reason, uh, the most steady, that means we have the sta um, stable emission of the ion is between 2 and 25 microns, uh, like this one, the B or C here. But when we look back, at the optics used in the fifth plan, you see the beam size is uh, um, contributed from stream beam paths uh, from the spherical uh, correlation, the virtual size, and the uh, chronopic uh, operation. So here, if you uh, uh, if we uh, if increase the, the extract voltage here, you will see at a certain amount, your source will be dominated by the aberration. So that's why in practice, we typically work at something around the two micron uh, ampere. So here is a schematic of the, this source. So if we look at the, uh, the schematic here, so, and superstar uh, is voltage is also applied here to maintain a constant current, the beam current we use in the in the field. So that's why the beam in the uh, gallium is sometimes limited at 100 nanoampere. So, concerning the plasma, the inductive coupled plasma source. So. Here is the two systematic to show how uh, it works. So you have your gas uh, flows into your plasma cell. There is a uh, radio frequency passing through the anatom to create the inductive field to accelerate the, or remove the electrons. So that causes the ionization of the xenon. And the xenon will uh, then is ext uh, extracted by this and accelerated into a proper so that you can use it. So to um, summarize what I have talked is um, limbs or the gallium, you typically have a um, point source with very low angular intensity. And uh, with the xenon, the ICP source we have here, you can have a um, broad source with a high angular intensity. That's why we have access to the 2.5 micron at 30 kV. Uh, but at the same time, which uh, uh, we need to pay attention is since the uh, xenon source is so broad, so that means the beam size is so wide, uh, so large. Uh, so that means we m might need extreme deflectification to get this crop size, which is uh, something I would say around 30 ampere in your Mexico. So once we got these two things, uh, the first question we ask is uh, how much is uh, damage to our sample? So here is a quick uh, stream simulation on uh, amorphous silicon. So with an uh, installation angle of um, 
uh, 90 degrees, which is a case for the cross sectioning. So if we look at the high res resolution TM image here on the top, is showing the um, amorphous layer uh, generated by the ion, and the top is the gallium, and the bottom one is the xenon. So we can see clearly that because of the the large xenon, the um, damage thickness has been decreased. So this uh, result has been further confirmed in the atom probe. Uh, as we can see here uh, on the silicon crystalline. So we have our uh, xenon is incident like this. So that means it's come on this side. And so here we see the xenon is have high, very high in, uh, intensity close to the edge. And uh, there is um, an intermediate region, we call that. You have this one, the, the content of your xenon is stable. And uh, after that, you have this one, it, um, its contents has decreased a lot. So if we look at so the uh, image of the uh, silicon and the xenon in the um, small rectangle like this. So we can see clearly the amorphs or the disordered uh, materials because of the xenon. And uh, this one corresponding to this area, we can see clearly the lattice. And here we see the um, lattice on the five nearest neighbor of this 111 silicon crystalline. So another thing we need to pay attention is uh, uh, for some elements, uh, you might have the imprisonment uh, from your, your gallium. So here is a quick example of um, which you have your silicon as your substrate, and you have a thin layer of the aluminum. As clear see by this yield result, we can see there's this uh, gallium is imprinted at these boundaries. So, so here is a list of uh, the elements we should pay attention: the aluminium, the copper, the iron, and the zinc, which is all this. Um, uh, knowing or common elements. So this improvement uh, uh, effect can further uh, be confirmed by some uh, indent uh, experiment here is a uh, uh, micro pillar uh, fabricate either by xenon uh, or gallium feed. So if we look at the uh, single crystal Samples we didn't see any difference uh, about the stress and the strain curve. But when we look at the uh, the different green sized uh, sample, we did see uh, for the for example for the xenon side, we see clearly the different slips according to the theory, and uh, we did see the uh, increased uh, strains uh, in accordance with uh, how patch effect. But uh, when we look at the gallium, you, you can see the, the grain is kind of popping out. It's mainly because of the embrittlement. So if we look at the cross, uh, cross section of this sample as marked by all these uh, uh, arrows here, uh, you have some very light contrast uh, uh, showing that in your image, which is actually the improvement of your gallium. So uh, now that the xenon is a very good um, tool to do all these uh, sample preparation, how can we, uh, or what about its uh, capacity in reality? So as we mentioned, we have access to very high current with the xenon feed, the p -fig. So here is uh, uh, some example uh, showing we can do the large area cross section. And so here I will say that thing is something around 100 micro, uh, uh, micrometer. 
which can be finished uh, uh, very quick. So uh, I mentioned about the iron damage uh, at the very beginning, so uh, which uh, is very important if we want to do some EBSD or high resolution TEM. Since uh, it's it's very it's very surface sen sensitive uh, experiment, so here is some result from the EBSD. So if we look at the gallium fee, so uh, if you do uh, your cross sectioning with a current like uh, twenty nine ampere, you can see your Kikuchi patterns of your HCD phase uh, is getting difficult to interpret. So Typically, you need uh, additional lower current polishing of your surface to get that uh, uh, your patterns uh, can be well uh, detected. But when you look at the xenon, even we look work at uh, 16 ampere, we still get these uh, very indexable cube sheet patterns. So, uh, because of, again, because of the high current, we can do the, this large volume blo uh, block lift out. So here is an example of uh, uh, preparing some sample for the X-ray tychography experiment. So uh, the sample has been mounted and the cop grid, so the, uh, the half cop grid, uh, this finger, the typical size is around uh, 70 microns, so it's about a half of the size size. So uh, for sure, we can use this uh, uh, xenon to do the traditional work in a uh, gallium, like uh, this one for some TM lift out, and even some very uh, um, very big uh, team, uh, TM lift out. You can include all your OEs rating of interest. You can have one, two, three, or uh, like. Uh, all your air flow interest on the same lift out. Uh, it's also uh, well used for the preparation of atom probe sample. But uh, uh, if you run some atom probe sample, you might, uh, or thanks to the xenon, it's because of it's very normal in uh, on some samples, as I mentioned, the, the, because of the improvement of the gallium. You might have the problem of get your sample uh, broken in the middle of your equation. So in this way, xenon of a very uh, the people of a very good way to prepare gallium-free samples. So also on this uh, PFID, we have an auto TM software, which means you can uh, follow the instruction of the system to prepare. Your some your TM sample automatically, so it men uh, it includes uh, men um, three parts. Like uh, when you do it manually, you need to to chunk your your lamella. You then need to take uh, it out, glue to a um, cup grid, and after that you do the your your thinning. So all this uh, uh, work is based on this uh, pretty show as you can see here. So here is a two quick example of the sample uh, obtained by the auto TM on some singers. We can see uh, clearly we have the access to the lattice image without any problem, and also on some uh the coating uh on some substrates you can do your tkd on it you can get here is a, actually the raw uh, tkd result without any noise reduction so the sample quality is very good so if uh, you are getting bored about this uh, automatic uh, stuff, we still have uh, some API or automation tools like the iFast, uh, like other Helios or FEI SEMs. You have access to the different hardware of your microscope. So here is a quick example like uh, you 
have the access to your uh, control of your uh, your beam setting, like the current, like the voltage, everything. So what is um, much more interesting with this uh, tool is we have access to the auto script, so which is based on Python. So as you can see a list of the different parameters uh, which you can access by your uh, by this uh, auto script. Uh, and also, you might know we have tons of uh, packages with Python. That means you probably can do some, uh, maybe some in-live imaging processing or in-live processing of your data when you acquire this. So that means you can customize whatever the automation you want to uh, access. So here is a quick example of uh, the, this kind of uh, automation. So if you use the, P, uh, the API FIP, you must, you must be familiar with this deposition process. You need to uh, calculate your beam current, which uh, should be used based on the, the deposition spaces you choose. So what I do here is I use uh, my auto script. I program, it will grab that box I put into the system, do the calculation and give me back the current. And uh, because of uh, this, we act, uh, because of the auto script has access to the different microscope uh, parameters. So it will put that current automatically for me. So uh, since we have the access of the carbon, platinum, and the tungsten, and also the mixture of the carbon between the carbon, platinum, and the carbon tungsten, so we need to think of the the deposition we should put on the uh, on your sample for your. Experiment here is an example of a TM lamella. So we can see because of um, uh, some some bad choose, uh, I was a bad choose uh, deposition layer. So we can see there are some uh, bending of my sample. Uh, close to the end, so which is uh, uh, it's not, uh, can, I would say, which cannot be recovered at least at this thickness. So probably, so for example, here I have my tungsten deposition at the bottom, and I have my carbon plus uh, platinum. So the reason I have here is because of I did my um, uh, top layer deposition at uh, 12 kV, uh, and that uh, introduced a lot of the stress into my deposition. So uh, here means we probably need to think about uh, a better geometry, like um, uh, and a thin layer of this carbon, uh, and maybe a thick tungsten. So another thing is, uh, uh, or some effect we need to take into account is the curtain or wrapping, or rippling in your sample when you look at uh, the cross sectioning. Especially you want to do some three D tomography on it. Here is an example of a bone sample. As uh, you can see here, we have deposited the carbon, platinum, and the tungsten on the surface. And uh, we try to do a mini tomo on it to compare the the clearance of the cross section. So here we see uh, with the carbon we have a very clean cross section. So that means your uh, the future of your sample has been well showing without any uh, hiding by your curtaining. So sometimes the um, the deposition can be 
useless, especially here is an example on the concrete. So even we put a very thick deposition here, you can see you still have this rampoling uh, in your in your cross section. So that way, a silicon uh, we put and uh, sacrificed the silicon mask on the top. So after that, that could be a um, uh, good resolution to get this clean cross section and also for your uh, your three D uh, acquisition. So concerning the um, the tomography in the P uh, in the FIB or in the P FIB is typically composed by three steps. So you start your uh, your experiment by preparing an air film test. That means you need to choose the right deposition as we have discussed. You might to remove the materials around your area of interest, like uh, this in a U shape to uh, avoid the shadowing of your, your signal to your detectors. So after that, you put your sample uh, into this position. You do your slicing. After that, uh, you might need to retract your air range, so you might need to do the autofocus, the auto stick again, and uh, take your image and re-slice again, repeat it, repeat it until you get a um, stack of image like this. So after the acquisition of your different image here, you need some uh, additional post-mortem uh, imaging processing, like the alignment, like um, both in X and Y. You might need to check uh, the, the thickness uh, of the layer you, you have been removed. You might need to do some segmentation of your image to uh, 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 to visualize the different future. Uh, after that, you might can do um, your your quantification of the different elements uh, from your your sample. So the uh, uh, I will say kind of the advantage of the xenon PC compared to the gallium is is a large access to the probing volume here. So Imagine you have a green boundary, large green boundary like this. You with a PFIP, you have the access to the whole image or whole volume of your your green boundary. But with the gallium, you are lim kind of limited maybe to a, a part of uh, its structure. So remind you uh, that sample when we do the in the gallium FIP, the sample was tilted. So that means. All this uh, uh, imaging has been taken with uh, some of the detects from top. You might have the shadowing effect, as we can see here, uh, which uh, your surface uh, close to the pole piece, you have this, this uh, bright, and this one at the bottom is dark axis. So for the uh, Secondary electron or backscatter electron, you can do some imaging processing after to uh, reduce or remove this uh, contrast gradient. But uh, that will be a problem if you do at the same time some EDX on this. So another problem is uh, since your sample is uh, inclinated, so if you work on, on, on a large area, you might need to uh, apply the dynamic focus on it. So uh, this dynamic focus can be um, uh, sometimes a um, problem if you run that at the same time with your autofocus during the acquisition. So because of that, we proposed an improved uh, PFIP SEM TOMO. 
So what we have here is, uh, again, that's a concrete sample. Uh, you can tilt with a pre-tilted holder like this. You can tilt your sample uh, so that the, the cross-section have zero tilt according to your uh, SEM column, which is basically like an, a typical SEM image. So because of this zero tilt, we have the possibility to insert the, the CDS here. Another thing uh, which is uh, very useful in the PFA is uh, the rocking polishing. So instead of have my uh, fit cutting always perpendicular to my top surface like this, we put a small angle, something between five or seven degrees. So that allows you to remove effectively your, your curtaining here. So here is a, a two examples on some on two very challenging, I would say very challenging sample, one on the concrete. You see here most of uh, the future from your concrete and the different phase, the crack and the different phase have been well shown. And also on this bone sample, uh, we see the different uh, uh, mini structure uh, inside it. So the results, uh, the three results of, have, of this volume have been published in this paper. You can check this one for more details. So here I'm going to show you another example like the 3D uh, tomography uh, on the battery. So the character from Akio uh, are interested in the, the morphology of this dual layer, uh, like uh, with the NMC on the top and the LFC uh, at the bottom. So what they interested in is uh, see if this uh, two layer uh, well segmented or if uh, there are any diffusion between these two uh, layers. So what I did here is uh, I clicked this with uh, both the secondary uh, action image and the backscat uh, action image. So I run on some uh, thing like uh, three sound slides, which uh, uh, was about uh, uh, three or four days acquisition. So another thing here I forgot to, to mention at the very beginning with the gallium when you do the tomo is uh, uh, you might the, need to hit your, your gallium during your acquisition, which is not stable. So comparing to the xenon, I, I have even run some experiments like for one week without any problem. So, uh, so the objective of this study is to look at how this interface uh, uh, looks like in 3D. Uh, is there any uh, evidence of the diffusion on this layer? So I started uh, with um, an EDX mapping on it to confirm the elements. So you have the element uh, substrate, you have the two layer like this. So when I compare my EDX results with my back started uh, action image, you can find some uh, uh, coherence or correspondence between the uh, elements and your contrast. So for example, the black one here we are seeing here is uh, the carbon, which can be confirmed by my EDX results. And uh, this uh, uh, white or brighter uh, elements we are seeing is uh, ion. So after that, I did my, so 
here is um, um, I will say a starting uh, imaging processing of the 3D image we have. So I start to draw on my uh, image. So I start to train my image here to tell the system ah my uh, white stuff is the ion, my um, black stuff is the carbon, and there might be something in between. So that will I will uh, see them as um, uh, the third phase. So I start to train them. I apply them to the different uh, uh, image from the beginning, middle, and the end of my experiment. So here is uh, from the very beginning, in the middle, and the, at the end, we can see my training is OK. I'm seeing my um, different contrast and the corresponding color without any problem. So after that, I can reconstruct it my uh, uh, volume in 3D to see here is um, you see in the three different direction uh, the projection of this 3D volume. So now we find or we can identify the layer we are looking for here. We don't uh so after that if i uh, i need to take my hands and show my video here so again that's the uh, uh different uh, three elements i identified from my edx so if i look my at my interface of uh, this dual layers, I didn't see uh, the evidence of the uh, diffusion uh, between the two layers. So that means we can confirm here the segregation of the two uh, layers, or I will say there's no diffusion between the two layers. So, until this point, I would like to conclude my uh, talk here. Like uh, PFIP is a very efficient uh, tool to do the gallium free sample preparation. It's uh, very quick. It's um, uh, you have a, a very, how to say, a very good quality of your sample from the perspective of uh, or either TM or atom probe or the cross section. So also we have the uh, the different capacity like the IFAS, like the the auto script. We can uh, or you can write the own tools you want uh, you uh, if uh, you are working on some some experience, you need to repeat regularly. And uh, as I seen uh, at the end, I hope I have convinced you that uh, this PFIP is also a very dedicated 3D slice and view uh, accretion tools. We can get very good quality. Uh, uh, 3D volume because uh, the stability is a very well, uh, very good stability of the system and also the very high resolution of the SEM imaging. So concerning the perspective, since uh, we are going to install the Oxford uh, instrument uh, EDSD and the EDSD decks in January, so uh, we are going to access to the experiment like the 3D EDSD and the 3D EDX on it. So, and also that could be a very interesting uh, uh, tool to touch it, like a growing boundary or some very specific uh, future 
when you prepare your atom probe, which is was very difficult uh, at uh, that size. So after that, I would like to thank all the collaborators and the user to bring all these uh, different uh, uh, interesting sample to work with and uh, all CCM colleagues for different uh, discussion, especially Andy Trapp, uh, who is retired now. Uh, thanks to him who prepared that project holder we use a lot for the 3D acquisition. And I also thanks uh, to the three faculty who bring this sample so we can have this uh, uh, amazing course I can use or I can play with. Thank you. Great, thanks, Hui. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we have some time to answer them now. So there are some questions. Um, the first question is, in the case of type 2,4 samples, which is the best protective layer, carbon, platinum, or tungsten? Hui, can you hear me? Just one minute, everyone. So can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the first question was, in the case of type 2,4 samples, which is the best protective layer, carbon, platinum, or tungsten? So uh, this uh, this question is um, is uh, also that was a question for me when you bring your sample also. So by default, you might want to use uh, uh, because the carbon plus or tungsten, the carbon is the blue, is the uh, uh, most uh, hard one and the platinum is the most soft one. So typically you want to adjust the deposition of this, uh, uh, the deposition to your samples. So after that, you might need to run that uh, small thermal as I, as I saw, uh, as, I, as I seen, or some very quick cross uh, or working polishing or cross uh, sectioning to see which is the best deposition you can use. Okay, um, on the same types of samples again, two four samples, what is the ideal working potential to not induce defects or implant gallium in the samples? So uh, there's many, many tips you need to, to pay attention. So for example, people, people or I typically start with some electron deposition. So without even any ion introduced at the very beginning of your sample preparation, and maybe something like uh, uh, um, 100 microns uh, nanometers protection, which is at, at the limit of the, if we look back into the series uh, simulation, you want to uh, be confident, even you put your ion deposition after your ion won't uh, generate any defects or uh, any improvement into your sample. 